want to um, first uh, thank the Board of Editors of the magazine for the Paladin Award because it means a great deal to me. I did not start writing Montana history and have the privilege of being edited by Vivian Paladin, but I do think that her uh, remarkable spirit has lived on in the other editors that the magazine has had. And I've been very fortunate to be edited by both Martha Cole and Molly Holtz. And I think that they are remarkable editors and have really elevated the quality of Montana scholarship that has come out of the Historical Society Press. So please congratulate them for their work. I also, uh, before I turn to my talk, and you notice I'm not using PowerPoint because I did not actually want to put up pictures of beef fudge and pork cake while you were having your lunch. But um, I want to speak for a moment as a member of the faculty at Montana State, and that is to thank Kirby Lambert and the entire staff of the Historical Society for um, always welcoming our students. And in this particular conference, making so many places for our graduate students and for you, the audience, who have given them such a great response and wonderful comments and connections. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that they presented here. And I'm very uh, much appreciative of the, because I know how much work the staff puts into putting on this conference every year. So uh, please join me in thanking the staff for this wonderful conference. <laughs> OK, well, on to pork cake, beef fudge, and huckleberry pie. What can food tell us about Montana history? In 1913, Livingston hosted the annual convention of the Montana Federation of Women's Clubs. To mark the occasion and raise some money, the Yellowstone Club, a women's club founded in 1892 as a literary society, put together a cookbook, soliciting recipes uh, that would make the book, quote, not only representative of the club, but of our home city. The cookbook committee received several hundred submissions, which it evaluated carefully before selecting which to publish, and the authors formed a cross-section of Livingston's middle-class homemakers. A few single women, a few widows, and a few students contributed recipes, but the vast majority came from uh, the wives of city officials, business owners, professional men, craftsmen, and managers and skilled workers of the Northern Pacific Railway, for which Livingston was a, div um, a division headquarters. So the compilers organized the recipes into fairly standard chapters, such as bever beverages, meats, breads, fish and eggs, pies. But they also included two chapters that were less frequently sh seen in Montana cookbooks, chafing dish cooking and frozen dainties. <laughs> Emma Hamilton, wife of Dennis Hamilton, co-proprietor of the Metropolitan Meat Market, was without a doubt the most ambitious cook represented in the Yellowstone cookbook. Her contributions included recipes with meticulous directions and unusual combinations of ingredients. Recipes for orange butter, fresh deviled crabs, stuffed rolled chicken breasts, dressings for goose and duck, and in the section on frozen dainties, one for huckleberry mousse. It's we're not, which unfortunately we're not having for dessert. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, it started with whipping a quart of cream ro uh, sweetened with rose water. Mrs. Hamilton then instructed readers to pour the cream into long cylindrical molds in which smaller molds had been placed. She noted that these were not easy to obtain in Montana, but <clears throat> could be improvised from cocoa tins and test tubes. <laughs> Once filled, cover the mold securely, and then to create the frozen dainty, pack them in ice heavy with salt and let stand for eight hours. While waiting, mix gelatin and lemon juice with a pint of huckleberries heated to boiling, and after that thickened, fold in a well-beaten egg white. For the next step, uncover the molds, remove the inner tubes, fill the space with the huckleberry mixture, repack, set them to freeze for another eight hours, then unmold, slice, and serve with homemade shortcake or homemade cream puff shells. I would have liked lunch with Mrs. Hamilton, <laughs> who I calculated her recipe for huckleberry mousse would take about 18 hours to make. <laughs> So when I first
first started doing research on food in Montana or on the history of food in Montana, virtually everybody I talked to about this project said, oh, are you using old cookbooks? And I, I'm sure that I kind of looked down and mumbled something because I had looked at some old cookbooks, but I did not have a clue as to how to get them to reveal any interesting history. Even after Molly Krukenberg, Zoanne Stoltz, and Jan Zuha and I decided to write a culinary history of Montana and to use the Historical Society's collection of over more than 600 Montana cookbooks, these um, often ephemeral and quirky sources remained very enigmatic. So it seems obvious you could look at these cookbooks and make a list of ingredients from the books and surmise that people in Montana ate that food, um, that when the books directed women to beat, slice, boil, fry, it meant that they had tools like pots, spoons, knives, skillets, and some kind of heat source. But really, is that very interesting? So how could we make cookbooks reveal richer stories about Montana's past? Well, as with all historical ventures, um, we had to read more broadly into the sources about the history of food and cookery, and we had to read these books more carefully. So let me give you an example by returning for a moment to Mrs. Hamilton's Huckleberry Moose. So a contemporary reader might easily think that a chapter devoted to frozen dainties would refer to desserts made in a refrigerator's freezer. But domestic refrigerators with freezers were not widely used in, uh, anywhere in the country until the late 1920s. And of course, as many of you know, in Montana, there were many parts of the state that did not have electricity until well after World War II. So a close reading of the recipes reveals that women were using the same methods for freezing that cooks had used for centuries. For instance, another Livingston housewife, Mrs. Edward McNamara, instructed her readers to, pay, to place their frozen mousse in tightly covered baking powder cans and to pack the cans in a box filled with a mixture of three parts finely cracked ice and one part salt. Hannah Glassy gave similar directions for a raspberry and cream dessert in 1747 in The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, one of the first British cookbooks to be read widely in the Americas. Glassy advised her readers, readers to use two pewter basins, the, the fruit mixture in one set in a larger basin of ice and salt. She noted these things are made at the pewterers. So pewter molds, test tubes, baking powder tins, cream, ice, salt, and berries. Women followed culinary principles developed in Asia and Europe and then transported to Montana. Several themes have emerged as we have read Montana cookbooks and looked at a wide variety of other sources. The use of wild foods, the transfer of foods between indigenous peoples and newcomers, the importance of pres preservation and the precariousness of food supplies in a harsh climate, the role of home economics, cooking classes, and newspaper columns in teaching cooking, the rich variety of ethnic foodways, the determination to have celebratory feasts even in the face of food scarcity, and the logistical challenges of feeding a mostly male uh, single workforce. But today I want to talk about just two themes. First, the great carryover of foods to Montana, and second, the long history of promoting local foods in sometimes novel ways. So historians have often described the goods that settlers carried with them on their journeys west, and I think everyone in this room has probably read those poignant stories of travelers on the overland trail who cast aside organs and books and spinning wheels and you know family treasures to lighten their load. Um, and it's possible that cookbooks could have been one of those discards, but it's far more likely that in the 19th and early 20th centuries, women, uh, most settler women, carried their knowledge of cooking in their heads or on handwritten notes. This meant that they transferred not only their cooking skills and techniques, but also recipes that meant something to them. They could have been as common as cornbread and biscuits, or as special as saffron buns, lefsa, or povetitsa. Between the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Montana drew immigrants from all over the country and all over the world. And traditional foods were, were powerful connectors to the places and people that they had left behind. 
So recipes from Montana's ethnic groups begin to appear in cookbooks in the first decade of the 20th century. The Red Lodge cookbook, compiled by the Ladies' Society of the Congregational Church in 1907, included recipes for Chinese fritters, German noodle soup, sour flesh, and potato dumplings. By 1923, Butte's St. John's Guild's cookbook had entire sections devoted to French, German, Italian, Jewish, Mexican, and Norwegian cooking. But still, most of the foods uh, in Montana's early cookbooks had their roots in English and New England cookery. M. M. Brashear wrote a short essay on the evolution of cookery as the preface to the Red Lodge cookbook and proclaimed, in our own New England, the proudest connoisseurs in cuisine have lived. Playing fast and loose with historical facts, she continued, although there is no positive evidence on this point, there is every reason to believe that John Alden's heart first yearned toward the gentle Priscilla when he had just eaten a generous piece of pumpkin pie, <laughs> the artistic production of that loveliest of Puritan maidens. So there's some fragmentary evidence that there was a cookbook produced in Virginia City in the 1860s, but the earliest one that we have been able to document is the Montana cookbook produced by the Ladies of Butte City in 1881. The first concern of the ladies of Butte City was to pass on what they had learned with tri uh, through trial and error about cooking in Montana. As they wrote, for reasons chemical and economical, a recipe which is a complete success in the East and South may prove wholly unserviceable here. Our butter is more solid and cakes require smaller cupfuls. Our atmosphere is lighter and beans must be boiled longer. Even our hens occasionally become lightheaded and are faithless to their duties. <laughs> so, that the <laughs> so that the cook, these faithless hens, my gosh, <laughs> the cook who adapts herself to circumstances must use fewer eggs. To compensate, the ladies produced or provided recipes thoroughly tested under very conditions of atmosphere and market in which newcomer women find themselves. So the Montana cookbook is full of recipes with New England and Southern antecedents, such as Parker House Rolls, Boston baked beans, steamed brown bread, oyster stew, lemon pie, plum pudding, maple mousse, and innumerable dishes using cornmeal, a, a good indicator of the southern influence. Everything from corn fritters to Johnny cake. The Montana cookbook also includes two recipes for pork cake, a confection that turns up repeatedly in Montana cookbooks. So pork cake illustrates what I think are two important themes in Montana's uh, food history. The determination to recreate the familiar and the need to cook frugally. For those of you who have never heard of pork cake, it's a dense, molasses-rich fruit cake packed with raisins and citron that calls for one pound of fresh pork fat as its shortening. <laughs> yes. So you can see why I didn't put a picture of it up on the board. Okay. So one of the earliest recipes for pork cake appeared in 1850, uh, 1857 in the Ohio Farmer. Other versions appeared in Boston in 1861, Connecticut in 1871, New York in 1881, Los Angeles in 1895. Bozeman's newspaper, the Avant Courier, carried a recipe in 1875, so pretty early. Now, I have not done an exhaustive uh, search through all 600 of Montana's cookbooks, but I have found recipes for pork cake in volumes from Fort Benton, Bozeman, Wisdom, Sydney, Poplar, Blue, uh, Butte, Roundup, and Helena. The earliest is 1881, the latest 1949. And some of the cookbooks, like the Montana cookbook, have multiple recipes for pork cake. So nowadays, Molasses, dried fruit, and pork are not necessarily cheap commodities. But in the 19th and early 20th centuries, pork was poor people's food. Molasses was much cheaper than refined white sugar, and dried fruit was a staple. Fresh fruit was a luxury. Pork cake also required no butter, no milk, no eggs, and the recipes were flexible. 
So most called for some combination of cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, cassia, and allspice. But as one recipe said, one teaspoon each, all kinds of spices. <laughs> so in other words, whatever you had on hand <laughs> and whatever suited, OK? And like all fruit cakes, pork cake had a long shelf life. Um, pork cake elicited more annotations in the cookbooks than, in a, than any other cake that appeared in the cake section. Like keep in a moist place, and it is better, and this is a, one of those great, um, I don't know, Freudian slips in printing. Keep in a moist place, and it is better for standing a mouth or so. <laughs> I'm sure she meant a month, but she wrote a mouth. Um, makes fine pudding and takes the place of fruit cake. This keeps a long time and equal to fruit cake or good for Christmas cakes. And if you think about, you know, fruit cake and the comment good for Christmas cakes, clearly in the 19th and early 20th century, this is a cake that would have been made in the fall, right? After hogs were slaughtered and you had that fresh pork. So pork cake, whose origins lay in 19th century rural cooking, made something of a comeback in World War II. Eggless, butterless, and milkless, it met the requirements of wartime cooking. And a recipe for it was published in Favorite Southern Recipes of the Duchess of Windsor, a cookbook produced to, fund, uh, to raise funds for the British War Relief Society. If you look up pork cake today on the web, <coughs> you'll find references to a cake my grandmother used to make. And culinary adventurers write blogs about their attempts to extract a pound of fresh pork fat from contemporary grocery stores. <laughs> so today, pork cake is a novelty. Uh, no contemporary cook blogger who made it actually liked it. But in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, especially and in Montana, it would have been a common cake. Its placement in the middle of dozens of other cake recipes in these cookbooks shows that it was not extraordinary at all. It was a cake drawn from basic staples, full of familiar flavors, easy to keep, handy to have on hand when unexpected visitors came by. It embodied the food traditions of immigrants from all corners of the United States who came to Montana. But one cannot live on pork cake alone. <laughs> and when I ask students today, what is an iconic Montana food, what do you think they answer? Beef. Beef, beef. right, beef, OK. So um, and the, the group that would be most happy to hear them answer beef is the Montana cowbells. Yeah. <laughs> In 1952, the Montana Stock Growers Annual Meeting took place in Butte. A group of wives attending the conference formed a ladies' auxiliary with the purpose of organizing social activities for women who accompanied their husbands to the Stock Growers Convention. And they named themselves the Montana Cowbells. Now, that was not an original name. The first Cowbells organization had emerged in Douglas, Arizona in 1939, and other groups followed in Wyoming and Idaho. The spread of the society throughout the western states led to the formation of the American National Cowbells in 1952, the same year that Montana was founded, or Montana chapter. But as is the case in the long history of women's voluntary associations, just um, what what often started as a social organization quickly took on other social and civic purposes. In this case, the cowbells became promoters of the beef industry. So working with the Montana Beef Council, the cowbells generated specifically Montana modes of promotion. They created Montana's beef mascot, Montana Slim a graphic sketch of a cowboy who carried the message, eat beef, keep slim. Um, and this was printed on recipe cards, napkins, posters, cookbooks, all kinds of printed material. Um, there was also apparently a very large, I'm not, I haven't been able to figure out what it was made of, uh, a figure of Montana Slim, like 10 feet tall, that was taken to various Boy Scout meetings, et cetera. <laughs> So while many ranch women were intimately involved in raising beef alongside their husbands or as independent ranchers, the cowbell's public face reflected a traditional gender role for women, cooking and feeding families. Hence, their work was exclusively dedicated to the consumption of beef, teaching women how to choose beef cuts, 
developing economical, tasty, and versatile recipes, and implanting a taste and talent for beef cookery at a young age. In 1962, the Cowbells introduced a statewide curriculum of beef education in the public schools, and they paid for the beef that students used in home economics classes. In the 1970s and 1980s, various chapters of the Cowbells across the United States published cookbooks promoting beef consumption, and Montana was no exception. And these are quite fascinating documents. Uh, Janet Allison of the North Central Cowbells wrote Stampede, Beef in a Hurry. Ding Dong All Beef Recipes came out of the Sydney area. Kitchen Treasures was compiled by the Treasure Bells of Treasure County. And the Big Timber T-Bone Cowbells produced the Cowbell Cookbook. So some of you might have these in your kitchens. Until the publication of, B of Stampede, Beef in a Hurry in 1973, Virtually all Montana community cookbooks were what we might call, for want of a better word, general service cookbooks. Produced by women's clubs and church auxiliaries, they were sold to raise funds for those community groups, but the recipes never targeted a special food or an even a food group. They sought to provide tried and tested, which is a phrase that appears on dozens, if not scores, of these cookbooks. Tried and tested recipes in all categories of food preparation for women who lived in local communities. But with the Cowbell's motto, beef is our business, beef makes Montana, and Montana makes beef, their cookbooks departed from this usual formula to focus on all ways to prepare beef. The two most interesting of these cookbooks were the earliest, Stampede, Beef in a Hurry, and Ding Dong All Beef Recipes. So Janet Allison of Chinook wrote Stampede, and if anyone knows anything about Janet Allison, I would love to learn more about her. Um, and in her introduction, she explained the book's purposes. All the recipes could be prepared in less than an hour. Virtually all used economical cuts of beef. Some called for leftovers, as she adjured her readers, wasteful cooking is not good cooking. And she testified that she had personally tested all of the recipes except for those um, beef salad recipes, which she drew from the American uh, National Cowbells, perhaps assuming there was not a demand for salad in Montana <laughs> in 1973. Okay. So Allison's compilation was heavily dependent on ground beef, uh, canned luncheon meat, and beef frankfurters. At the very back of the book were two recipes that called for sirloin steak, one for beef stroganoff and one for beef bourguignon. Now, theoretically, the cowgirls would have loved Julia Child, who has perhaps the most famous recipe in America for beef bourguignon. On the very first episode of her television show, The French Chef, in 1963, she taught her audience how to make this classic beef stew. Julia told her viewers that she had experimented with many beef stews to prepare for this, that she had experimented with many cuts of beef, and she illustrated them on her body. This was here, this was here. Um, and, then, um, and that she had determined that chuck was the best beef to use for this recipe. So she has these big slabs of meat on her kitchen counter, and she points to them, and she uh, tells the audience you know, what the different parts of the roast were, and then she teaches them how to cut it, brown it, deglaze it, um, make this dish. These were all things that the cowbells were trying to teach Montana women in their cookbooks. They had often had illustrations of the different cuts of beef and lessons about how to cook it. Now, in 1963, Chuck Roast sold for about two-thirds the price of sirloin, so I think that Janet Allison would have been very impressed by Julia Child's frugality. But of course, no one in Montana had ever seen Julia Child. The French chef was broadcast on public uh, television out of Boston. Montana did not have PBS until 1984, more than 20 years after the debut of the French chef. We uh, have the singular honor of being the last state in the United States to have public television. <laughs> um, but a few Montanans might have purchased her cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, which came out in 1961. In fact, I picked up a second printing of the 1961 edition at a Bozeman yard sale, so it could have been around. But 
stampede, Janet Allison's uh, stampede cookbook's recipe for beef bourguignon bore le very little resemblance to Julia Child's. Um, why are you laughing? Okay. <laughs> okay. So Julia's recipe called for beef, bacon, olive oil, carrot, onion, red wine, beef stock, tomato paste, garlic, thyme, bay leaf, salt, pepper, flour, small white onions, and fresh mushrooms, mushrooms sauteed in butter. And the stew was supposed to cook for uh, slowly for three or four hours. Allison's recipe also called for beef and red wine, but it relied for flavoring on onion soup mix, canned onions, canned mushrooms, and a single green pepper. <laughs> Preparation and cooking took 20 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, they were, she was counting on the tenderness of Montana beef, I think, right? <laughs> So while Julia Child wanted to teach Americans how to cook French food, she still presumed that her cooks had time. And of course, many ranch women in Montana did not. Allison, who also wrote a column called The Ranch Kitchen for the Haver Daily News, which often featured a la more elaborate and frankly much more delicious sounding recipes than those she chose for Stampede, you know, obviously geared her cookbook uh, to this uh, desire for a quick preparation for dinners. So the Cowbells cookbooks were designed not only to teach women how to buy and cook beef in inexpensive ways, but to work beef into as many forms of food as possible. You can see where I'm going here. <laughs> so the Ding Dong All Beef Recipes cookbook had the most extensive variety of, might I say, weird beef recipes. <laughs> beef sugar plums, beef apple cookies, beef muffins, beef pecan cream cheese balls, and the iconic beef fudge. <laughs> now the origins of beef fudge remain murky to this <laughs> historical researcher. Um, the first recipe that I can find for it appeared in Montana simultaneously in several Montana newspapers in 1965. And then it disappears for a while, only to be revived in the mid-1970s, and it has continued to be reprinted ever since. In the 2009 Best of the Best from the Plains cookbook, beef fudge is described as a must for every Montana cookbook, exclamation point. Now, while the recipe might be a must, how often it has been eaten is another question <laughs> altogether. The Billings Gazette called beef fudge a try it, you'll like it idea that a lot didn't want to try. <laughs> the most basic recipe for beef fudge simply says to substitute cooked ground beef for half the nuts in your favorite fudge recipe. Um, and later versions specify using ground roast beef instead of just ground beef. Okay. So the Cowbells Eat Beef campaigns arose from concerns for their own family businesses to keep up demand for beef and strengthen the industry that shaped their lives. To that end, they devised clever marketing campaigns, brought beef into the public school curriculum, and invented novelty foods like beef fudge, which in and of itself might not have increased beef consumption, but certainly raised beef awareness. <laughs> but I do not want you to think that the mid 20th century beef industry is the only Montana agricultural entity to promote its products, nor to think that this kind of promotion was a fairly recent phenomenon. In one of the most unusual banquets ever held in Montana, visiting members of the Massachusetts Street Railway Association descended underground to the 2100 foot level of Butte Steward Mine in 1910. Guests outfitted in overalls and miners' hats got off the mine cages to find linen and flower bedecked tables, uh, mine, real authentic miners pushing mining cars back and forth to give a sense of the work that was done, and a Macintosh apple from the Bitterroot Valley at each place. 
So apples were in fact one of the first Montana foods to receive wide promotion. In 1923, a three-day apple show in Butte targeted housewives. According to the Anaconda Standard, the Butte Chamber of Commerce was intent on diverting at least some of the cream of Montana apples from their markets in the eastern states. For several years, according to Dr. Peter Potter, a physician, civic reformer, and member of the Horticultural Society, Butte residents had been forced to eat apples from, gasp, Washington and Oregon, <laughs> and had been receiving only third or fourth class Montana apples because the best were shipped to New York. To New York. So growers from the Bitterroot, from Jefferson, Flathead, and Gallatin counties sent 400 boxes of apples to the mining city, showcasing over 30 different varieties. Wholesale fruit merchants set up displays with labels enumerating each variety's distinctive characteristics, stem, blossom, colored, and uncolored cheeks. And on the show's last day, the apples were mixed up and simply numbered, and then the city's housewives competed to see how many of them they could accurately identify. Those attending the show drank 150 gallons of apple cider, and the Montana Power Company served 1,000 baked apples with cream. So Willard Thompson, chairman of arrangements, gave the banquet address, Montana Products for Montana People. And the success of the Apple Show produced, uh, prompted several others. In 1926, at a Montana horticultural, horticultural products show, Miss Jessie McQueen of Montana State College Extension Service gave cooking demonstrations using Montana apples, potatoes, sugar, and flour, and handed out 400 mimeograph sheets of recipes. The show concluded with a banquet serving only food grown in Montana. H.G. Bullock, a bitterroot potato grower who attended, noted that, quote, the daily demonstrations held during the shows brought home to the Butte housewife the convincing evidence that Montana apples and Montana potatoes, Montana peas, Montana cherries, and other state farm and orchard products are the finest in the world. Every time a demonstration was given, some dozens of converts were made to the wisdom of buying Montana products. So, over the course of our work on uh, Montana's culinary history, Jan, Molly, Zoanne, and I have had many fantastic, illuminating conversations. Zoanne, early on, remarked that one of the reasons Montana cookbooks were so important is that they named women. And all of you perhaps remember the old saw, a lady's name should appear in print only three times, at her birth, her marriage, and her death. One of the characteristics of community cookbooks is that the name of each recipe's contributor is attached to her work. In early cookbooks, as in so many historical documents, we often have only a, a woman's married name, just as with Mrs. Edward McNamara, one of the frozen moose makers I mentioned earlier. When I first began my research on uh, food in Montana, it was partly to find an answer to the question, in a country in which we frequently measure worth by pay and skilled work, and in a state and a region in which there's very little professional work for women and very little paid work other than domestic service, how did women claim worth and recognition? And I thought about the currency of recipes, sharing recipes, trading recipes, hoarding recipes, entering fair contests, raffling cakes, hoping for a winning bid at a basket social, or priding yourself on knowing that a threshing crew looked forward to eating at your place. In other words, earning recognition for good cooking. Just this summer, the Bozeman Chronicle published an obituary for a woman named Margaret Hamilton. Born in Butte in 1918, she passed away at age 96. She earned a teaching certificate at Montana State College in 1940. Her first teaching post was in Antelope. She married in 1948. Amidst her other accomplishments, her obituary stated, she was an excellent cook, making the best pasties in Butte. She also made everyone's favorite huckleberry oatmeal cookies and her traditional ham loaf for picnics. Cornish pasties, huckleberry cookies, ham loaf. 
Margaret Hamilton's star recipes encapsulate Montana's culinary past. The carryover of immigrant foods, the use of native foods, the embrace of economical cooking. It is a culinary past that has treasured tradition, embraced the local, and made do. And that's pretty good cooking. Thank you.